The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. Hi, I'm Dan Hoffman, the host of Farm Connections. We travel to Farm Fest to learn more about how our food, fuel, feed, and fiber is produced. We talk to a couple of young pork producers and ambassadors for the pork industry. We also visited with an experienced soybean producer and the executive director for the Minnesota FSA office. We also learn about technology and how drones are making a difference in how our food is produced. Stay tuned for Farm Connections right now. Welcome to Farm Connections with your host, Dan Hoffman. Farm Connections on KSMQ is brought to you in part by Primrose Retirement Communities in Austin and Mankato. Primrose, a provider of independent and assisted living, is a proud sponsor of Farm Connections. Primrose, this is living. Task AgriPlan Now is an employee benefit program that enables family farmers to take federal, state, and self-employment tax deductions on health insurance premiums and out-of-pocket expenses. AgriPlan Now is a proud partner of Farm Connections. Will Mahler, the Ag Attorney, has been representing dairy farms in Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin for more than 38 years. Will Mahler, the Ag Attorney's office, is in Rochester, and Will, a proud partner of Farm Connections. Thanks, Will Mahler. Hi, I'm Dan Hoffman from Farm Connections. Today, the staff and crew of Farm Connections travels to FarmFest near Morton, Minnesota. And with me today is Matthew. Welcome, Matthew. Welcome, Dan. I watched you flying some things around here that look like UFOs. What's happening and what are they? <laughs> well, Dan, they're not UFOs. They're actually what most people like to call them drones. They're actually termed small unmanned aerial systems. Uh, we're flying these drones today to show growers how easy they are to use, how they can capture data off them and benefit their farm. Well, you gave a lot of examples, such as checking out grain legs and silos. Can you expand on that? Sure. Um, with our little scout, our Phantom Vision 2, what we can do is we can fly a field, see if there's stressed areas out there, be able to fly over that when the crop is above your head so you can't see it anymore. An aerial picture really shows and tells a story that none other can. Uh, as you saw with our fixed wing aircraft, we flew this field and what we did there is, is got a near infrared or an NDVI, which is Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. What, allows, what that allows us to do and the growers to do is to take that image, come back, and make management decisions on that farm to make their crop better. These are called elevons. Anybody who knows a little bit about aviation, there's ailerons and elevators. Well, you put them together and call them elevons. What happens? Is it reflection of light off the chlorophyll or the plants? What are you, what are you really measuring, Matt? Yes, that, that's what, that is what we're measuring. We are measuring um, the health of plant based upon a, a different light band spectrums. And we do, today is a little cloudy, so we don't really like to fly in weather like this, but uh, it is nice to have a nice clear day to do that. Uh, what that does is that takes a, a reflection off of that crop and, and what the photosynthesis or what the, the bands are coming back on is, is what's measured. We put that down to our processing center down in Des Moines. They come back and they give us a raw image as well as what's called a shape file. And the raw image is basically just a visual picture. The shape file is really the, the bread and butter. We can put that into uh, SMS software, which is an egg leader software, or SST, and uh, the crop consultant, the grower, if he's educated enough, can take that information and apply it with their yield maps, with their varus cart, uh, with other previous imagery, variable rate technology such as planting, spraying, uh, chemicals, and fertilization. So you can layer the maps? Yes, we can layer the maps and uh, build what's called uh, compilation maps or composite maps. And what the composite maps do is we take uh, normalized data and we take deviations from the mean off that so we can actually pinpoint different spots within the five or six different layers and see what's the correlation between them. And as we build the correlation, what, what our drones and our in-field flights are showing us is that we can, we can scout these fields further on into the season. It's not just a we planted it, it looks good till we're knee high, and after that we really don't know until the fall time. Really we're bridging the gap between that knee high corn and our fall yield map. All right, so the mission's complete and it's circling again. Do you guys have any questions as of right now? 
How about if you have TV towers, <laughs> towers like that? There, there are safety features in there. Go, they'll, where it'll go away if it's so close. No, she'll, she'll it'll go right, right in. into them. Yeah. <laughs> and so, is that where your liability insurance comes in if it hits a plane or something? Yeah, that's why. I mean, I don't like flying this low on doing missions because you can see it's hard to judge when you're flying oh, by those yeah. trees way back over there. What do farmers do with that data when they once they get it? Uh, well, it, it kind of depends if they've got a trusted advisor to handle that or help make decisions with them. Um, most guys bring that data back, evaluate the field. We're able to process the data from the flight within about a day, sometimes two days, depending on how much data we've flown, and get that back to the grower. What that allows us to do is, is get it back to the grower in a timely manner, and he can make management decisions on variable rate technology or whatever it may be to go out and adjust that field. So they take a look at themselves or with a crop consultant. Cost of the equipment and the service? Cost of the equipment um, for the little uh, little drone or UAV that we have, that uh, complete package is $2,150. That's $2,150. Uh, we do give a one hour training session with that just because it's so important that everybody knows what to do with this. That does come with a couple um, overview of the regulations. Our larger one that we flew today is around uh, that mid teens to 20 area and that has a near infrared camera so it, it kind of really depends on what you want what your goals are and that's what we want to talk to you about. Well you talked a little about it Matt but expand on the economic return of this purchase. Sure. Um, I'll just use an example that we did this year uh, one of the growers that's a very good friend of mine we did some side dressing with him and we flew the field about three days before he was going to side dress we got the data back and in, in the next day we went out with a mobile device that we had the map on and we created management zones and sampled tissue samples from those management zones. So when we got back, we were actually a little surprised. Some of the areas, they didn't need nitrogen, although it, 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 it maybe looks like they did. They actually didn't need nitrogen, just needed sun. So we, we were able to save on 28%. We side dressed 28%. We were able to save on that product. Uh, what that allows it to do is that, that brought the cost of that application down quite a bit for that guy. And on that field in particular, he saved $900. So he, uh, he, he was pretty excited about that. Extremely interesting. What a great tool. Yes. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That was a fascinating demonstration of how technology and drones are making a difference in agriculture. Join us next as we talk to two young pork producers. Well, at Farm Fest, I was lucky enough to meet up with two pork ambassadors. Jacob, welcome. Nice to meet you. Andrew? Pleasure to meet you. Welcome. So what's this pork ambassador work? What are you doing, Jacob? Uh, we're here just promoting uh, what we do as pig farmers and all the pig farmers that are at home right now as well. We're just out to spread the good word of pork to people around the state and do what we can to promote it. Well, how did you get to be an ambassador? You just wake up one day and say, I'm going to do this? Well, actually, we both started as county ambassadors, elected by our own counties. I'm from Freeborn. I'm from Goodhue County. And uh, then we came up here and partake in the state competition, and that involves an interview, a presentation, um, as well as some group work. What kinds of things stick out as great experiences over the past year? Um, I've had a good experience meeting the individual farmers, seeing their farms, as well as going to some uh, comp or, uh, uh, the AFA Animal Institute down in uh, Kansas City, Missouri and meeting up with more leaders in the, in the pork farm world as well. Andrew, I heard you mention AFA. Can you tell us what that acronym means? It's the American Future of Agriculture Leadership Conference and it's a group of young ag leaders from around the country that come together to one big conference down in Kansas City and there's some guest speakers and panels and then we just get to meet people from around and interact. It's a real good time. Why is it important, Jacob, to interact with people outside of your own community or state? Well, the trouble right now is so many people are uh, generations away from the farm and they really don't know how things have changed. For instance, farrowing right now is, is a big topic, or the farrowing gestation crates. We're having trouble because people um, that have been detached from the farm still think they, they uh, farrow out in the pasture underneath the little tree, but we lo no longer do that. We put them in the barns in a climate controlled facility where we can give them individualized attention. What would happen in January if the pig was outside? That would not be good. They like, they like it at about 90 degrees as soon as they uh, are born. 
Andrew, what's the biggest challenge of young people moving into fields of agriculture, particularly production agriculture? Well, if you grew up on the farm and you, know, you were there your whole life, it's not too big of a deal. Um, but if you're like me, I didn't grow up on the farm itself. I worked on it and I still do. It's going to be a little bit more difficult. You know, I got to figure out how I'm going to get land and things like that. But I believe it can be done. You just got to make friendships along the way and get to know people and connections. I think connections is a real big, real big point for that. Jacob, same question for you. I would agree as well as the fact that it takes a lot of cash flow. Dad, Dad has always told me that if anybody came into this not knowing how much cash I bring in and out every day, they'd faint. So the, the amount of cash flow to get, to get started is, is, is huge right now, as well as what he said, finding land. And because there's a lot of farmers right now that are like my dad's age, they're not ready to retire yet. They're, they're just starting because their dad stayed in it a long time. What kinds of things can you identify that will help you move into the field of agriculture? Say a mentorship or working with somebody that has experience. Can you elaborate on that? Um, internships. I had, a, I had a wonderful internship this summer and it's really gave me a whole other site of farming that I haven't been. I've been working along with dad doing more of the laboring portion, whereas this summer I did more of a crop consultant and be, behind the, um, the desk kind of work, figuring out what, what's going to yield here, what we need here, what, what we need to test and tissue test here. Tremendous. Thanks again for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're still at FarmFest, and what a great opportunity to meet a lot of people involved in agriculture. And with me today is Craig from Minnesota Soybean Growers. Nice to meet you. Craig, I noticed on the shirt Minnesota Soybean, but can you expand on what that means and what you do? Well, Minnesota Soybean is actually two organizations together. Minnesota Soybean Growers, which is the association side, and uh, the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council, which is uh, the checkoff side. We have also talked to some young people that are involved in agriculture. How does the Minnesota Soybean Growers Association and the Research Promotion Council work with mentoring young people to make their profitability and involvement in agriculture better? Well, there's, there's uh, several programs. Um, uh, we have uh, action teams, we call them, and uh, one of those is the Education Action Team, and, and I sit on that um, committee. And we are work, we, you know, we work with DuPont Young Leaders, is one of the programs that's been a very good program. Um, we have an ambassador program. Um, we work with FFA on some things. And, um, and we are gonna focus some efforts on developing, what I guess what I call new leaders and, and young leaders to come from the farm and uh, volunteer their time to help um, you know, make soybeans more profitable ultimately is what happens in it and it's, and it's difficult for young people to do that and we want to come up with a good program to be able to, to bring those people forward. As we think about the future of farming, Craig, and the future of the food supply, what are the biggest challenges young people have to getting into your field? The biggest challenge? Um, one of the things that comes to mind, of course, is the revenue. Just to go out, just to get up one day and decide that you're going to go buy a farm and start farming is, is not going to happen because of the revenue that it takes to, uh, to do that. So the way it works is that you work into it slowly. And in my case, I've only been farming for 14 years. And, um, but I knew I wanted to stay close to that. And so that's what I did when I chose my professions. Um, I was either working for a farmer, driving truck, hauling livestock and grain, or selling seed. And then my opportunity opened up. Um, and I guess that's, that's the way farms pass on. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a direct family member, um, but you need to work into it very slowly and learn a lot of on-hands things as you go along. I guess pay some dues along the way. And, uh, and then that revenue situation can be 
helped with with the, the person that you're working with and you get started and just slow it's a slow process to take over that farm. Well thanks and keep up the good work Craig. Thank you. Next, we're going to visit with Deb Caruso, the Executive Director of the Minnesota FSA. Thanks for joining us at FarmFest. With us is Deb from the FSA office in Minnesota. Deb, welcome. Thanks, Dan. Nice to be here. Well, what are you doing at FarmFest? Well, I'm at FarmFest promoting our programs with the Farm Service Agency. Um, this is where all the producers come, all the farmers and landowners come, and my job is to get the word out on our programs and what we can do for the for the producers of Minnesota. Well, dating myself a little bit, but with farm business management, we used to call your agency something different at one time. Correct. I, we used to be Agricultural Stabilization and Conservation Service, and in 1994 we consolidated with the Farmers Home Administration, and we are now the Farm Service Agency. Always trying to be more resourceful and, and, and wise use of resources. Correct, correct. Well, you mentioned programs, Deb. What are some of the programs that you offer to agriculture and farmers? You know, we have a lot of programs. Um, I could start by letting you know about conservation. We have the Conservation Reserve Program. Um, we do buffer strips and whole fields put in conservation for use um, to conserve the land. Uh, we have credit programs, and we've done a lot of good things with a new program called Microloans, which is available to small farmers and niche farmers to loan them money for agricultural purposes. We also have marketing loans available to traditional commodity producers. We loan dollars for grain bins um, to store grain for when the prices are low and um, many other programs that we offer. Well, why is it important, you mentioned conservation, why is it important for a federal and a state agency to be involved in that process? You know, conservation is so important to, to our land and, the, and our resources. Um, there's been a lot of talk recently about water quality. Conservation plays a big role in preserving those, the water quality in our state, both the ground water and the surface water. Um, the buffer strips that we offer in conservation is a great tool to use along ditches and rivers to help filter the sediments from the land that go back into the river. So when you say a buffer strip, Deb, I'm imagining a waterway that's moving water and a field up close to it, but it's been moved away by this buffer strip. Would that be a... That's correct, right. It's usually about 20, 10 to 15 to 20 feet from the river or the ditch up into the field to filter the water with grasses. Well, you mentioned water quality, and that, of course, is a very important topic. But beyond that, soil conservation, can you expand on that? Soil conservation, the CRP program, Conservation Reserve Program, is used as a great tool for highly erodible land, land that is hilly and probably does a better job in conservation preserving. We pay um, landowners to keep that soil out of production and into a conservation program that helps preserve the topsoil. Conservation is a huge, huge thing and it's very important to all of us. Well, if, if we lose a farm, one generation, it affects many following generations. That's true, that's true. I know that, you know, the statistics these days are showing that the large farms are getting larger, but also there are, our smaller farms are getting larger. So there are producers, new producers that grow vegetables, um, flowers, um, all kinds of niche crops, and, and um, they have come into the economy. There's a lot of them in the metro area that, that uh, market to farmers markets. They do a wonderful job. It's a commodity that the citizens really want is fresh produce. So yes, there's a lot of different types of farms and we are there to support them all. Is that part of the micro loan program? Correct. The micro, micro loan program was created last year by um, USDA Farm Service Agency and it was designed for the small producer 
and we do loans as small as a thousand dollars and up to thirty five thousand dollars and we've tried to streamline the process for individuals to make it more simple for them to apply and to become eligible. So how would a producer or potential producer interface or contact your office and, and get some help? Okay, um, if they have access to the website, you can go on the website at uh, www.fsa.usda.gov. You can click and you can find any county office in Minnesota. We have 74 locations throughout the state. Um, otherwise, if you call the USDA Farm Service Agency direct in the state office, we can hook you up with the, whatever county you need to be in and they can help you acquire our services. And if you're applying for a loan, do you need balance sheet, cash flow information? Um, normally, that's what you need is a cash flow and, and balance sheet. Um, if you're new to that, if you're a traditional farmer, you probably know what those are. Some of our newer farmers that, that do vegetable crops don't know all of that. And there's some really good training that's provided through the state of Minnesota to help them with that, and we can hook them up with those resources. Awesome. And what's the website again, please? Um, www.fsa.usda.gov. Well, if you've been in business that long with the FSA, you must have some success stories you can share. I do, and I have one that just recently happened last year. An individual, I made a trip to a place called Big River Farms in St. Croix Valley. There's a lot of immigrant and migrant producers that farm there, and it's a training site for them to learn how to farm. They're all traditionally farmers, but they're not used to the customs that, that, that we have here in the United States. And I made a trip there and visited some of the producers, and I met a Somali gentleman that was just doing a fabulous job. He had three acres of land, and the one thing he told me as he showed me his crops was that he wanted to buy his own land someday. And I found out from my one of my farm loan teams that he had applied. We, we needed an interpreter, which we provide at no cost. Got an interpreter, got him into the loan program, and he received a loan to buy um, a tiller for himself and some other things to help him with his small farm. That's got to be gratifying. Yes, it's very much so. Awesome. Well, thank you so very much. Thank you. Great program. Appreciate the Thanks. information. Thank you. Join us next for the Student Leader of the Week. I'm the president of the Tracy Area FFA chapter, and I do a lot of different jobs. None is more important than the next. In the beginning of the year, we have a range of different activities. In the fall, we kick off with our corn drive. In past years, we've been really successful with that. A couple of years ago, we actually were the top uh, corn gatherer for Minnesota and we had over $30,000 that we brought in in one day and that was really incredible for students to go out and experience that and then all that money goes to Courage Camps which is what FFA is all about, giving back to the community and serving the community. We are a small 300 acre farm. Uh, my grandpa started that farm and I've been helping out on that ever since I was little. However, I don't feel like I am that traditional farm agriculture kid. It's the other areas, the commercial fishing and the concrete work that make me unique to agriculture. Just like so many kids are becoming unique to this, you don't have to have that hardcore farm background in order to be involved with the FFA. And I, I grew up on that and I got started in the FFA through my advisor leading me towards those supervised agriculture experiences and it was just a great experience. Once I started that, there was no looking back. It was full on. I wanted to enjoy everything that FFA had to offer me. Agriculture, mechanics, fabrication, and design. That's the concrete work. We do concrete for a lot of farmers around the area, whether it's uh, building floors or shed floors that they need to help work on equipment. And so we work with those farmers that need that. We go out to lakes and we sand the rough fish with a net that is roughly about 10 feet wide. 
and ranges in different distances, whether it would be a mile or half a mile, depending on the size of the body of water that we are seining. And by rough fish, I mean the carp and the buffalo that we take out. The carp can be very hard on the environment, and so that's why we take them out. We work directly with the DNR. When we catch a load of fish, we have to say how many we caught of each type, and also what we caught for game fish, the walleyes, the crappies, and the catfish, and others. We have to help them to see what's in these lakes and what's populating these lakes. It helps to give them more numbers about what's growing in these lakes, because through the years, they can see they're catching more of these fish. That means these lakes are getting better and better. And as they're taking out more of these rough fish, the lakes are also getting better. Next year, I'm planning to go to South Dakota State University to major in agronomy. Uh, my brother is an agronomist, and it's something that's really struck me as that a job that I want to do in my future. I love to be outside. I knew for a long time that I would never be in an office cube working because that's just not for me. I really like working with the environment and the natural resources. And so I think an agronomist is the way for me to go in my future. Thank you for joining us on Farm Connections as we traveled to FarmFist and learned about technology, drones, and some very interesting people. Join us next time on Farm Connections.